Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, if you recall last time, uh, we ended the lecture by establishing the equivalence, uh, excuse me, of the symmetry of the Cauchy stress, the equivalence of that condition with the invariance on, of the energy function as a function of deformation gradient, invariance under rotations of a rotation following the application of F. And that means, as we've seen, that the strain energy depends, as the name would imply, the name would suggest, the strain energy is a function of the strain. And interest, it's interesting that this simple condition guarantees the symmetry of the Cauchy stress and is also guaranteed by the symmetry of the Cauchy stress. So it's an equivalence relationship. So we never again have to worry about the symmetry of the Cauchy stress if we simply use this result here. Of course, um, <clears throat> that's far from satisfying the momentum balance laws. We still have to satisfy the linear momentum balance, which is, a, of course, a, a great challenge. OK, um, let's revisit our energy balance equation, mechanical energy balance. We derived that the, the power of the forces exerted on a part of the body, P sub R, let's say, in, in the reference configuration, is equal to the stress power plus the time rate of change of kinetic energy. And we also established last time that now the stress power is itself the derivative of some quantity U given by the integral over that part PR of our strain energy per unit reference volume. Okay. So this, <clears throat> this statement is true for any subvolume of the body, and hence by, and, and hence also for this for the uh, entire body itself. You simply take this, the body, the subvolume to coincide with the actual volume of the entire body. So we'll call this capital U, the strain energy contained in that region, that that set of material points P sub R. So this suggests something interesting. So. On the right-hand side, we have the time derivative of something, namely k plus u. So this suggests that we look for conditions under which perhaps the left-hand side is also the time derivative of something. Say, so suppose, let's, let's examine conditions under which there exists a capital L such that the power of the forces acting is its time derivative at, for a fixed set of material points, in other words, for uh, the entire body in this case, okay? Um, recall that the, the power had this expression in terms of Piola stress, the power of the, the sort of Piola traction acting on the boundary of the body and the power of the body forces. So we're interested in conditions under which this P might be the dot of some quantity. Right. Well, you can immediately identify one trivial or simple case in which that would be, the, be true. For example, if, if P is an assigned function of position independent of time, just a function of capital X, on some portion of the boundary, call it D kappa sub P, the portion where Piola traction is prescribed. And if chi, the, mo the deformation, is a fixed function of x independent of t on the complement of that part, on the remaining part of the boundary, which means the velocity, the time derivative, would be zero on this portion, the second portion. And if further, the body force per unit volume, which consists of mass density, which we know to be a function only of capital X, the referential mass density, that being a consequence of conservation of mass, that times the body force, if that were a prescribed function of capital X independent of time, then we could take the dot and enclose, enclose the P and the chi together in the dot because P dot would be zero. We can enclose the rho kappa and the B inside the dot because its time derivative is zero. And then we can uh, reverse our usual procedure and extract the dot itself from the integrals, 
because as, as usual, this we're integrating over the reference configuration. And so this furnishes us with an obvious example in which there exists such an L. L is just the term in parentheses. And of course, we can add a constant because that constant is annihilated by the derivative, the time derivative. So we can have a constant of integration if we like, which has no mechanical significance because it's only the power that, that enters in the mechanical energy balance. So quite often we would just simply suppress this constant, take it to be any constant. So in these circumstances, here's, a, here's just one example of a situation in which there exists an L, we'll call it the load potential, such that it's derivative over the body, time derivative, is equal to the power of the loads acting on the body. So in that case, we can combine uh, all terms under a, a single derivative, a time derivative. We have dE dt equals zero, where E now is k plus u minus L. We would, we would call this E the total mechanical energy of the body and the loads together. So L we'll call the load potential. U minus L we'll call the potential energy of the body and the loads together. And K of course is the kinetic energy. So in the case when the power, the, the, the applied loading on the body is such as to admit the existence of a load potential defined such that the power is the time derivative of that load potential, then we have this energy conservation law. Energy is conserved, the total mechanical energy is conserved. And for this reason, such loads that give rise to the statement are called conservative loads. And this case we've considered, this is called, um, excuse me, this is, this is called dead loading. In other words, no matter how we deform the body, the traction on this portion of the boundary, the body force in the interior, they do not change with deformation. So they, we think of them as being dead. So the, the standard example of this is hanging a weight from a, a mass. As the mass moves around in space, the weight is always a fixed magnitude and fixed direction. So we think of that as being uh, an example uh, of this kind of loading, dead loading. But dead loading is not, is not by any means the only type of conservative loading. There exists many loadings which give rise to a so-called load potential. And in your homework, I'm asking you to explore the possibility that a, a pressure loading might give rise to a load potential. A thermodynamicist would immediately say, well, pressure times volume would be a kind of uh, a potential energy for, for pressure. And that's true under certain circumstances, which I'm asking you basically to quantify in your homework. Okay, so we have this energy conservation law. Underlying this conservation law was the assumption of pure elasticity, which is an idealization of reality, right? We have a, a the stress power being the time derivative of some energy. In reality, uh, real materials exhibit uh, other effects, non-elastic effects, which are dissipative in nature. In, in other words, they have the feature that even, even with the same loading conditions, the energy as we've defined it, the same definition of the energy based on a strain energy function, kinetic energy, and load potential, that its time derivative will actually be less than or equal to zero. And the reason for this is, uh, arises because of the dissipation of energy. Dissipation simply means this inequality here. The dissipation of energy due to effects that we've not yet taken into account, such as heat conduction, viscosity, and ultimately also plasticity is a dissipative mechanism as we'll see later. In your homework, I'm asking you to exhibit this property, this dissipative effect 
if we adjust the constitutive equation for the stress to include a viscous contribution. And I'm asking you to examine to show that under realistic assumptions about the viscosity of the material, you have you will derive this inequality. Okay. That's just an illustration of the of the situation if we want to take real physical processes into account. Okay, so this has an implication, this inequality, the, the idea that energy is dissipated. The implication is, for example, suppose we have an initial condition, we have some initial deformation, chi at some time t0. This is not our reference configuration, it's simply a, a deformation at some time t0. We'll call that chi sub zero of a capital X. Suppose our motion begins at this time t0 and for a large time ends up at another configuration, another deformation, say chi sub infinity corresponding to time going to infinity. That then is a function only of x. So suppose we have this, we have a situation like this. We would then say that this configuration chi sub infinity uh, is an attractor for this motion. In other words, um, this would be an asymptotically stable state in the sense that a motion commencing at this configuration chi naught would ultimately tend to this configuration. So suppose we have this situation. Then we can simply integrate this dissipation inequality here with respect to time, integrate this from t0 to infinity, and you will find that the energy at large time, as t goes to infinity, the energy of, the, of this state is less than or equal to the energy of this initial state. So this dissipative mechanism has the feature that it ensures that an asymptotically stable state, say, Suppose chi naught is some arbitrary initial condition, and no matter how you choose that initial condition, you end up at this chi infinity configuration. Then you would say chi infinity is asymptotically stable, that asymptotically in time as t goes to infinity. And the energy at that asymptotically stable state is then an energy minimizer. It's a minimum relative to the initial state. And that's interesting because we can now recast the problem of studying these asymptotically stable states as an energy minimization problem, which is a problem in the calculus of variations. The classical problem in the calculus of variations is concerned with characterizing such states that minimize the some what we call a functional a scalar valued function defined over the body, in this case, the energy itself. Okay. Um, here, I, what, I, what I, should have, I should have appended more information. Let's suppose that the initial velocity at time t zero is zero, and the velocity as t tends to infinity is zero. That means the kinetic energy at time zero and at time infinity will be zero. So when you do this energy comparison, this energy comparison here, the kinetic energy terms drop out and you're just left with the potential energy, okay? So take, take note of that, I, I should have put in the, uh, zero initial velocity assumption. So imagine releasing the body from this, this deformation chi naught at zero velocity. Suppose the motion then tends to this state asymptotically and the velocity asymptotically tends to zero. Then this inequality only involves the potential energy U minus L because the kinetic energy terms drop out. So here, uh, I've taken that into account here. Here's U, the integral of the strain energy, 
And in the case of dead loading, this is our L, our load potential. Viola stress, remember chi dot was zero on the complementary part portion of this traction boundary. So the load potential does not sense anything happening on this complementary part of that, the complementary part of that boundary. And V is also independent of time. So in the case of dead loading, for example, this is our potential energy that we want to minimize. So we'd like to know in particular, what are the implications of such a statement for the strain energy function? If the theory is to admit into existence energy minimizing states, stable states, which is what we would expect physically, then perhaps there are some restrictions that should be obeyed by the strain energy function itself. Let's examine some conditions. <clears throat> Let's look at a one parameter family of deformations. I'll say u is the parameter in some interval between minus u naught and u naught, where u naught is a positive number. And let's suppose the state corresponding to u equals zero, I'll simply call it chi x, is an energy minimizing state, minimizing, minimizing the potential energy. So here's our variational problem, minimum problem posed again. So we would then have, for this one parameter family of configurations, we would have this inequality for all u in this interval. And the energy then is minimized when u equals zero, right? It's minimized by the configuration chi corresponding to u equals zero. So we can define a function of u, which is our potential energy, evaluated on this one parameter family of configurations, deformations. Of course, the potential energy is defined as involving integrals over the domain of the body and its boundary. When one evaluates those integrals, all that remains is a function of the parameter u, because we're integrating over, over x, the variable x. So this statement means this function f of u we've defined is minimized at u equals zero. So naturally then, it should be stationary at u equals zero. Its derivative with respect to u should be zero at u equals zero. And its second derivative, evaluated at u equals zero, should be non-negative. Okay. <clears throat> Here I've, I've uh, introduced this phrase, kinematic admissibility, kinematically admissible one parameter family of deformations. That simply means that chi should meet the position boundary condition on the complements of the traction portion of the boundary for all values of the parameter u. So for example, here in the, uh, excuse me, kinematic admissibility for us would mean that for all values of the parameter u, chi of x and u should be some function of x alone that we prescribe on, the, on that portion of the boundary, the, the complement of the traction portion of the boundary. So for our purposes, this is the meaning of kinematic admissibility. Everywhere else, chi can be arbitrary. So we insert this one parameter family of, of deformations into the energy to define f of u, and we have this. F then will depend on U because it's the gradient with respect to X of this one parameter family, gradient with respect to X. So this kinematic admissibility means the U derivative of chi should be zero on the complement of the traction portion of the boundary because the right-hand side here does not depend on U, okay? So we're now in a position to evaluate the derivative of f with respect to u. That would be by the chain rule, d psi df, evaluated at u, inner product, the derivative of f with respect to u, 
which is this the gradient of the derivative of chi with respect to u. The u derivative acts like just a, a material derivative, just like a conventional material time derivative. Mathematically, it's the same operation. So the gradient commutes with the prime derivative, right? F prime is, this, is, is the prime of grad chi, which is the same as the grad of chi prime. And so here we have then minus b, that doesn't depend on u, u, rho kappa b doesn't depend on u, inner product chi prime. And here p inner product chi prime. And I've suppressed the capital X as in the notation just to ease the notation a little bit. So we would want this quantity, f prime u, to be zero at u equals zero, corresponding to our energy minimizing deformation. We also want the second derivative to be non-negative at u equals zero. Let's compute the second derivative for any u. Take a second derivative, that means take another derivative of this, the d squared side df squared. I'll write that as this fourth order tensor with these Cartesian components times f prime again, but we already have the f prime here. So bring down this f prime, grad chi prime, and then wait, d, psi, d squared psi df squared multiplying f prime, which is grad chi prime. So use the square bracket notation for this kind of operation. This is a fourth order tensor, operates on a second order tensor. When you're done with that operation, the whole thing is second order tensor. Now take the inner product with a second order tensor. In Cartesian components, that would look just like this. Okay. Again, F prime is the gradient of chi prime. So that, that is the contribution from this term. But now we have other contributions. We have, we can hold this fixed. Psi, the, the psi df, and then take a further u derivative of this term, give us this. And then we take a further derivative of these terms, we get second derivatives of chi. Now, the first derivative with respect to u of chi is identically zero for all u on this portion of the boundary. So we can take a further derivative of that and chi double prime, the second derivative with respect to u, must also vanish on the same portion of the boundary. Now we want to evaluate these derivatives at u equals zero. So let's use this notation, chi prime, that's the derivative with respect to u, at u equals zero is just a function of x, we'll call it u of x. Chi double prime at u equals zero, we'll call it v of x. Because the prime is mathematically identical to a material time derivative, except that the time here is just the parameter u, we could call this a velocity-like quantity. u is like a velocity. We'll call it the virtual velocity. And we can call v, for the same reason, the virtual acceleration, if you wish. Virtual means simply that this need not have anything to do with an actual motion in time of the body. It's simply some geometrically possible configuration, chi x u of the body, and then we're simply taking u derivatives of that, one parameter family of configurations. And we have from what we've just done that the virtual velocity and virtual acceleration vanish on the complementary, on the a part of the boundary, the complementary to the traction portion of the boundary. But otherwise, these are arbitrary functions of capital X. So we want F prime to be zero at u equals zero because the state corresponding to u equals zero is a minimizer of the energy. So the slope of F should be zero at that state. We had here a d psi df, which was just our Piola stress, inner product grad u from the previous page. I'm just replacing chi prime by u when evaluated at u equals zero, uh, scalar u equals zero. And then these additional terms here in the case of dead loading. 
you can work out in components if you wish that this inner product is the same as the divergence of p transpose u minus u dot divergence of p referential divergence in both cases so that by the divergence theorem we can take this term now to the boundary and keep this term in the volume i'll write it down here combine it with the body force term and we still have this traction term here <coughs> P is simply the PL the stress, the, the, the value of the constitutive function at F, where F is the gradient of chi, which was our energy minimizing deformation. Now we had that the vector u is zero on this portion of the boundary. So this only this integral can be reduced to can be the, the domain of integration here can be replaced by d kappa p because on the remainder of the boundary, u equals zero. And that step allows us to combine this term. This is inner product of u with p n by the definition of transpose. We can combine that term with this traction term. And then we're left with u inner product divergence p plus body force. That's starting to look like an equation of equilibrium right? Whatever this is, let's call it capital A. It's some function of x alone. And this parenthesis we'll call capital B, another function of x alone. And so the stationarity condition, this yields equation one. What in the, in the uh, literature, you often find this f prime u, this is called the first variation of the energy. So at an energy minimizing state, the first variation of the energy must be zero. So this has to be true for all u of the type that we've indicated. The only restriction on u whatsoever is that it should vanish on the portion of the boundary that's complementary to this traction portion. Otherwise, u is entirely arbitrary, an arbitrary function of x. So this should remind you of kind of a, an inner product in a vectors, right? Except we're talking about functions in, uh, instead of standard vectors. An inner product, think of this as an inner, u inner product sum vector is zero for all u. You would expect that the vector itself should be zero, or at least the integrands here should be zero. We can prove that. If this is good for all u of x, then it's good for this choice. We can pick any choice we want, such that u vanishes on the complement of that portion of the boundary. Here's one choice of u of x. Some uh, positive function of x that vanishes on the boundary times this a of x. If g of x is zero on the, on the entire boundary, then it's zero on the complement of this portion also. It forces u to be zero on the complement of that portion. So it's an admissible, a legitimate choice of u of x. If we make that choice, the boundary integral disappears and we're simply left with u in a product a, which is g squared, a dot a, which is the squared norm of a, a is a tensor, a, a is a, a, is a a conventional vector here, vector field. And that has to be zero. G is not zero in the interior of the, of the body, zero only on, on the boundary. It could be zero uh, at various places in the interior, but it's, the requ only requirement is that it should be zero on the boundary. So the only way this, this integral can be zero, because it's the integral of a non-negative quantity, is if the integrand itself is zero. Because if there's any place where, say, a is not zero, then the square norm is positive there. If the integrand is continuous, then it, the square norm will be positive in some neighborhood at some point where a is non-zero. And then you get a positive value of the entire integral, which would be a contradiction. So the only way this can happen is if norm of A is zero, which means A itself is zero, 
and that gives you this equation for all points in the interior of the body. And that's simply the Piola equation of equilibrium that we've seen before, of course. Okay, so we've concluded that a necessary condition for the energy to be minimum at the configuration chi x is that that configuration should satisfy the equation of equilibrium, the differential equation of equilibrium in the interior. Now, a of x itself has nothing to do with u of x. This is just one choice, but it, this, this u can be arbitrary. If this is true for one u, as we've seen, then because it doesn't involve u, it's true for all choices of u. And so this volume integral disappears entirely because of this. Right? And then we're simply left with this boundary integral. The boundary integral reduces to this, u dot b equal integral equals zero for all u that vanish on the complement of the traction portion of the boundary. We can do the same trick as we've just done. If this is true for all such u, it's true for this u. Pick u to be some positive function times the vector b with h equals zero on the boundary of the traction portion of the boundary. This is a curve, right? So here's the traction portion of the boundary. Here's the boundary of that, the curve, and that adjoins the complement of the traction portion of the boundary, where u has to be zero here. We'll force it to be zero here, so it, it's, it's simply the continuous extension of zero here. Okay, and only here in the interior of d kappa p do we have take it h to be non-zero. So then we get the integral over d kappa p of h squared b squared equals zero. Again, the same argument gives b equals zero, which means the traction boundary condition is satisfied on the portion of the boundary where we prescribe traction. Okay. So together, that means an energy minimizing deformation is an equilibrium, necessarily an e equilibrium deformation, right? Same idea if you hang a, 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 a pendulum with a weight on it, it'll minimize its energy when the pendulum is vertical, and that's an equilibrium state. It will stay there if you release it, okay? We're not finished because we need the so-called second variation of the energy to be non-negative. Again, that's just the second derivative of f with respect to u at u equals zero. That was this, if you recall, this b squared psi df squared. When u equals zero, I'll call that calligraphic m. It's a function of f where f is, again, the gradient of the minimizing deformation. And this was the f prime, which that's the grad of chi prime. Chi prime is u when scalar u equals zero. Inner product grad u. And then we had the chi double prime terms here, which are just v, when u equals zero, PLS stress, etc. Okay. So again, this object, m, is a fourth order tensor. Here are its Cartesian components. If the strain energy is a twice differentiable function of f, we could interchange the order of the derivatives here and conclude that we have this symmetry. MIAJB is the same as MJBIA. We call that major symmetry. Um, okay. That reminds us of the notion of symmetry for an ordinary second order tensor, which involves the definition of the transpose. We can make a similar definition of transpose for fourth order tensors. For a fourth order tensor, the definition of transpose is this. M transpose is such that for any second order tensors A and B, A inner product M transpose operating on B is the same as B inner product M operating on A. That's identical to the standard definition of transpose. And this now is for all second order tensors A and B. This symmetry here, we've just discovered this major symmetry. You can convince yourselves that this is equivalent to the notion that 
m is equal to its own transpose as a fourth order tensor. For example, you could simply take b equal to basis elements small e sub i tensor product capital E sub a and take this to be small e sub j tensor product capital E sub b and you from this expression would immediately produce this equation. Of course, you might you may wonder you may ask now what if psi is not c2? Well psi is something we would have to determine experimentally. And normally when we take when we do experiments we fit data uh, using some functions, for example, uh, we, we can all, we can, in, in practice, we can always fit typical data using polynomial functions, for example. In fact, any continuous function can be, can be approximated by polynomial. And so as a practical matter, it's okay to restrict attention to C2 strain energy functions because empirical data would normally deliver such functions in any case. Okay, so that's a bit of a digression. Okay, so now let's go back to the second variation of the energy we had here. Let's look at the second line. Previously, we said that the second line with, if V was replaced by U, the second line was equal to zero. That's, that's the vanishing of the first variation for all U that vanish on the appropriate portion of the boundary, the complement of this part. Well, V is such a, a, such a, a vector field, it also vanishes on the complement of this portion. So V is, is one of those vector fields for which the second line vanishes. Okay, that means the second variation reduces simply to the first line at an equilibrium state. In other words, if the first variation vanishes, then the second variation is simply this. So this is a restriction that involves these fourth order tensor made from the second derivatives of the energy with respect to F. And for our equilibrium state to be stable or an energy minimizer, asymptotically stable, it's then necessary that this inequality should be satisfied for all U of X that vanish on the complement of the traction portion of the boundary, okay? That u of x has nothing to do with f, f here, which is the gradient of our minimizing configuration. Think of u as a, a velocity superimposed on that energy minimizing configuration. So <clears throat> it's clear then that in order for our theory to admit the existence of stable equilibrium states, which is what we would want because we observe such states in practice in the laboratory, any configuration that you see persisting over an interval of time is presumably a stable state, otherwise it would, it would uh, disappear into some other state spontaneously. We would want a theory that admits stable equilibria, allows equilibria to be stable, then we should impose some res suitable restrictions on our strain energy function. And that leads to um, an inequality that uh, I refer you to the handout we'll get to in a moment in your notes called the legendre hadamard inequality, which goes back uh, sometime in the history of the calculus of variations. And it turns out kind of remarkably that if this integral this inequality, this of course, of course, involves an integral over the body. If this is satisfied for all u of x with the stated properties, then necessarily this local inequality must be satisfied at every point in the material. So this is an inequality in which we replace gradient of u, a general second order tensor, by a tensor product of two vectors, two arbitrary vectors. I'll call A and N. Um, so it's, it's not at all obvious that this should be the case, right? So again, the significance here is this integral inequality implies this local pointwise inequality that has to be true at every point in the body 
where a and n are arbitrary vectors. That's called the legendre hadamard inequality. And it has important implications for elasticity. For example, if you've taken linear elasticity, uh, you've seen this before in the context of uh, wave propagation. This, this inequality guarantees in the context of linear elasticity that waves propagate with real valued wave speeds. In other words, it guarantees that waves will propagate and not simply be stationary. They'll propagate with a certain speed, a real number. Okay. So although this looks like a rather abstract notion, it's of very great significance uh, for mechanics. Let's look at how we get that inequality. So here, uh, here's a handout I distributed some time ago. Here's our second variation inequality, integral inequality. U of x has to be zero on this portion of the boundary. And we want to show this local inequality where a and n are arbitrary vectors. Um, how do we do that? Well, let's pick a particular admissible u of x. This, has, this is true for any, any admissible u. So provided we choose an, a u that is admissible, we're okay. We're allowed to do that. Let's pick this u of x. u of x, some small parameter, a positive number epsilon, times some vector function of capital Y. This is just a change of independent variable, capital X to, cap, to capital Y, defined in this way. X naught is some fixed interior point of the reference configuration, kappa. Epsilon, again, is a small parameter. So you can think of this as a map from position X to position Y. We're just relabeling points in the reference configuration. So here, X naught is an interior point of the reference configuration. Epsilon is a positive constant. And Xi, it will say it's compactly supported in an interior region. That means it's non-zero only in an interior region away from the boundary. We'll take that interior region, we'll call it kappa prime, a region containing the fixed point X naught. So you imagine surrounding the point X naught with the region kappa prime, strictly interior, and psi is non-zero in that interior region kappa prime. Under the map from X to Y here, kappa prime becomes the region D, just a relabeling due to the change of variable. So psi is non-zero in a region D, which is strictly interior to the body and it contains the point X naught. Okay, everywhere else outside that region, psi is zero because we construct it that way. It's just a, a, a function that we construct it's admissible because it's zero on the, in, not only on the boundary, the portion of the boundary where it has to be zero, but in fact on the entire boundary. Okay, so it's an admissible choice of U and that's all it has to be. Um, there are some steps here I'm, I'm asking, I will ask you to fill in in your homework. If you make the change of variable, you, you write U in this way, Inequality one requires a gradient with respect to capital X. You can rewrite that as a gradient of Xi with respect to capital Y using appropriate change of variable, okay? When you do that, the parameter epsilon will be involved in the, in the change of variable, expressing gradient U with respect to X in terms of gradient Xi with respect to Y, you can do that. And also the, the dv will be changed also. dv is based on x. Because of the mapping from x to y, there'll be a, a factor of epsilon cubed involved in the change of variable. So when you integrate over d, which is the domain of the y variable, you will get this inequality. And everything outside d is zero because we, we construct it psi that way. 
this inequality here, the gradient is with, now with respect to y. And the integration is with respect to the y variable over this region d. And a, if you follow the steps here, make the change of variable, divide the resulting integral inequality, inequality one, by epsilon cubed, and then let epsilon go to zero. Epsilon is, is a parameter that we choose. We can make it as small as we please. Carry out these steps and you get this inequality where A is this M tensor evaluated at X naught, the point X naught. So I'll let you fill in those steps to get to this equation, inequality four, okay? Um, so this inequality four is a necessary condition for inequality one, the basic inequality, the second variation inequality. Um, it turns out to be convenient to extend this inequality, if we can, to complex valued vector fields. So this is, psi is an ordinary real valued vector field. We can extend it to complex vector fields by introducing a real part and an imaginary part. I, I is the complex unit, I squared is minus one. So psi one and psi two are two real valued vector fields. If you then form this product with one of the factors, say, equal to the conjugate of this psi, so psi conjugate would be psi one minus psi, psi two, the gradient with respect to y of that, if you form this product, you will find, and then asking you to show it in an exercise, you will find this combination involving psi one, psi two, no, with no coupling. All the coupling between psi one and psi two occurs in a coefficient of i, but in such a way that that coefficient disappears. And that's due to this transpose property, the symmetry property of the original M. M was equal to its own transpose as we've seen a moment ago, and therefore A is equal to its own transpose. I'd like you to show in homework that that means the coefficient of I is zero. And that means if this inequality here on top, equation four holds for any real valued vector field psi of Y, then it would hold also for psi one of y and psi two of y separately. We would add two, the two inequalities you get from this one, this one and this one, by integrating over d. The integral of this one over d would be non-negative. The integral of this one over d would be non-negative. Add them together, you get that the integral of this is non-negative. So we get this. It just turns out this form is just a bit easier to manage. So if the original inequality one, the second variation condition is true, then necessarily this inequality is true for any complex valued psi of y. Again, this is a necessary condition. It's not sufficient. In other words, it's implied by the original condition one, but it does not imply that condition. It's only implied by that condition. Okay, so now let's construct a simple psi of y, a complex valued psi of y. I'll put in, a, I'll define psi of y this way, a fixed vector a, a fixed vector n, exponential i k, a real number k, n dot y. This is a complex exponential, which you know is just decomposable as a cosine and a sine. Right? Uh, and then we'll add such that this psi is compactly supported in the region d, I'll have to multiply by some function with that property. F of y is compactly supported in D and I'll take it to be, everything is real valued unless you see the i. The i is where the complex, the only complex aspect of it, which makes psi a complex valued vector field, okay? I can take the gradient of this now with respect to y. I'll let you do that. You can show that that just gives you the exponential back again. Then you get IKF times the gradient of, of this parenthesis and the exponential, which gives you uh, 
a tensor product of A with N. You should verify that for yourselves. And then we have to take the, the gradient with respect to F, which gives you A tensor product grad F with an exponential factored out in front. So now I need to take the complex conjugate of this. That's easy. Wherever you see an I, replace it by minus I, and that would give you the conjugate. Then you form this product. The exponentials will drop out because e to the i k n dot y gets multiplied by an e to the minus i k n dot y to give you one. And then you get an i k, excuse me, an i k term here, and then a minus i k, which gives you a plus k squared term in here and so on. And what you get, to take the resulting inequality and say divide it by the number k squared. A, remember, was evaluated as a quantity only associated with a fixed point x naught, so it comes outside the integral. A and n were fixed vectors, so those come outside also. You just then, with less of the integral of f squared, Divided by dividing the whole inequality by k squared gives you this k to the minus two times what's left over. You can't bring this outside the integral because f is a function of y, which varies over, over the domain d. Now k is entirely at our disposal. It's a number that we've chosen. We can make it as large or small as we like. Let's make it large. Let's look then at the limit of this inequality as k tends to infinity. As k tends to infinity, the second term, regardless of the value of this integral, the second term will disappear. The first term does not involve k. This integral of f squared is some non-negative quantity, a positive quantity. So this inequality demands that this be, be non-negative, where a was the value of this, our second derivative of energy with respect to f at the point x naught. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove. That's this inequality because the point x naught was arbitrary in the domain, the interior of the body. So this would that would be true for any point in the interior of the body, and because that point was arbitrary. Okay, so we've shown that this so-called Legendre-Hadamard inequality is a necessary condition for the second variation to be non-negative, and hence a necessary condition for our configuration chi of x to be stable or energy minimizing. And that puts a restriction on the strain energy. Okay. That restriction, uh, let's go to the next page. In components, it looks just like this. This is A tensor product N, inner product M operating on A tensor product N, just a component version of that. The, the M, this fourth order tensor is evaluated at the gradient f of our energy minimizing deformation. The vector a and the vector n are entirely arbitrary. Again, this has to be true at all points in the body. So if there's even one point in the body where this inequality is violated, if you can find vectors a and n to violate this inequality at, at one point in the body, then the entire configuration is unstable. It cannot be an energy minimizer. Okay. Um, in practice, we would like a condition that involves not the derivatives of energy with respect to F, the second derivatives with respect to F, but rather the second derivatives of energy with respect to strain. Remember that in order to satisfy our requirement of having a symmetric Cauchy stress, we want the we need the energy to depend on F through the strain tensor. So let's examine that, the implications of that. So let's go back to our one parameter family of configurations, any one parameter family. The prime again is a U derivative, the derivative respects of the parameter. Gradient of chi prime is the prime of the gradient of chi, in other words, it's the prime of F. We know that the Piola stress is the first derivative of 
psi with respect to F, the energy. The second purely Kirchhoff stress, as we saw last time, is the derivative of U with respect to the strain, where U is just psi expressed as a function of the strain. And of course, Piola and second Piola Kirchhoff are related in this way with F intervening, P equals Fs. We can differentiate this equality here with respect to the parameter U. On the left, we have the Psi DF prime, which would be D squared Psi DF squared operating on F prime. So that's just P prime. On the right, we have F prime S plus F S prime. F S prime, on the other hand, that's a prime of this. So it's second derivative of U with respect to E operating on E prime. E, of course, is one half quantity F transpose F minus the identity. If you take the prime of that, you can quickly see that that's just the symmetric part of F transpose F prime. Okay. So that sits, you insert the symmetric part of F transpose F prime here in this place. Let F prime, which is arbitrary, let it, we will denote it by A in place of F prime. Uh, it turns out I don't need to, the prefix sim here, I don't need to worry about the symmetric part because this product only sees the symmetric part of this argument here. In components, for example, this thing here, d squared u d squared e prime, the component form is just this. And we have a symmetry with respect to c and d because the strain is symmetric with respect to c and d. So e prime would be the symmetric part of f transpose f prime. It automatically, that product automatically annihilates any skew part of f transpose f prime. So we can dispense with the the prefix sim, because it only sees the symmetric part anyway, okay? So we have this relationship, okay? This d, psi, d squared psi ds squared is evaluated at f, which is the gradient of our energy minimizing configuration. S is evaluated at the associated strain, and so is this, and f, and so on. Um, our legendre hadamard inequality involved tensors of this form, the tensor product of two vectors. Such a tensor is said to have rank equal to one. A rank, it's a rank one tensor. If you recall the, the notion of rank from linear algebra, the rank of this object is actually one. We'll, we'll discuss that later in more detail. So we re replace A by vector A tensor product N, we have this. We get an A, small a, uh, tensor product N with an S here, which is the same as A tensor product S transpose N, but S is symmetric, so we don't need the transpose. And here we have the same replacement. The legendre hadamard inequality says, take a further inner, inner product with A tensor product N here on the left. And if we do that, you can easily and quickly show that that's the same as this. If you use this identity here, if you use the trace definition of inner product, you can play around with the trace definition to derive all kinds of useful identities. In other words, Sometimes you have an inner product of a tensor with another tensor, which is itself the product of two tensors, and you want to get the third one on the right-hand side of the dot, you can play around with the, tensor, the trace definition and show this, which we can use to reduce the legendre hadamard inequality to this inequality. So our strain energy expressed as a function of strain has to satisfy this more complicated looking inequality, this legendre hadamard inequality at all points in the material. That involves the stress explicitly, 
as well as the second derivatives of energy with respect to strain. Um, let's have a look at, for example, let's evaluate this in the reference configuration. And suppose, so in the reference configuration, we have no strain, right? Because F is the identity. Suppose the stress happens to be zero when the strain is zero. We'll see later that that's really a kind of a, a fiction. In, in general, materials don't have uh, the property of uh, real, real materials, I should say, are essentially almost never truly stress-free in a global configuration. We'll see that plasticity is a, is a the primary reason for that fact. But let's suppose for a moment that we have the stress zero in our reference configuration and therefore at zero strain. The inequality we just derived or this, this equation four here, if we put in F equals the identity, then we have an identity here, identity here, zero strain, if, if S is zero at zero strain, this term drops out and we have D squared psi DF squared evaluated the identity operating on A equals this evaluated at zero strain operating on the same A. In other words, we get this, where this C is the second derivative of energy with respect to strain evaluated at zero strain. It can still be a function of X if the material properties are non, are non uniform. This C is the classical, the tensor of classical elastic moduli that you're accustomed to in courses on elasticity or strength of materials. <clears throat> Suppose, for example, that a reference configuration is stable or that it's an energy minimizing state. Then the Legendre Hadamard condition in this case boils down to this inequality. Right? In particular, the term involving stress would, would be zero if the stress vanishes at zero strain. And that would just deliver, furnish this inequality here. So this gives us an actual restriction on the possible values of the moduli appearing in the classical elasticity tensor. Okay. We could, if we evaluate the second variation of the energy at the reference configuration, suppose it's an equilibrium configuration, it's, it's energy minimizing. So the second variation would look like this and it would have to be non-negative non at F equal to the identity. Well, because of this result here, that's the same as this involving the classical elastic moduli. These classical elastic moduli have the same symmetries that I mentioned before. We'll call these uh, mi the minor symmetries. In other words, so, so here, here is, if you evaluate this at zero strain, you get the classical moduli. Not only are they symmetric with respect to interchange of A, B, and C, D as a pair, as pairs, but also with respect to interchange of A and B, and separately interchanges C and D. Those symmetries are called minor symmetries. And because of the minor symmetry, this inner product only senses the symmetric parts of gradient U. So we like to guarantee, for example, that we, if we're interested in using a reference configuration, which is itself a stable equilibrium state under zero stress, which is typically what we do in practice, we would like to guarantee that this inequality is always satisfied. We can do that by making this assumption that C itself is positive definite. That is, we have a strict inequality here for all tensors A with a non-zero symmetric part. This product only senses the symmetric part of A in any case. Okay. This would guarantee that no matter what A is, whether it's symmetric or not, we have this non-strict inequality because you might put in a skew tensor, in which case you would get zero. 
happening because the, the minor symmetries of C only sense the symmetric part of the tensor. And if the tensor is skewed, then that symmetric part would be zero. Okay, so an assumption essentially always made in, in classical linear elasticity is this one, or in the case of small strains, uh, this assumption that C is a positive definite function. Uh, it's a function on the space of symmetric tensors. It's a, think of uh, the, the set of symmetric tensors that's essentially the set of symmetric three by three matrices. That's a six dimensional vector space. In other words, any linear combination of symmetric tensors is itself a symmetric tensor. So the set of symmetric tensors is a vector space in the mathematical sense of the word. And this inequality says that the fourth order tensor C is positive definite on the linear space of symmetric tensors. That's entirely analogous to saying a second order tensor is positive definite in the conventional sense on the space of ordinary vectors. You know from that context that such a tensor is invertible and exactly the same idea pertains here. This assumption then implies that C is itself invertible, an invertible fourth order tensor. Let's look at the implications of that. Let's look at the second piola Kirchhoff stress. That's the value of this constitutive function. That's the derivative of energy with respect to strain at evaluated at E. Let's suppose E is small. If not zero, then small. So that we can tailor expand this function about E equals zero. The first term would be the derivative evaluated at E equals zero. The next term would be the second derivative evaluated at zero operating on the strain, the strain E minus zero, which is just E. And then we'd have nonlinear terms, higher order terms, small o of norm E, where the norm of E is just take the tensor inner product of the tensor with itself, take the positive square root, right? Use the trace definition of inner product. And that's what we mean by the norm of the tensor. This first term is just the stress at zero strain. If that happens to be zero, then the leading order term is just S equals this fourth order tensor at zero strain. That's just our classical elasticity tensor, fourth order, operating on the strain. So that's our linear stress strain relationship. And then these nonlinear terms would be small, negligible, if E itself is small and norm. So if we, if we suppress these nonlinear terms, then we have the classical linear stress strain relation. And from what we've just said, we know that C is invertible, which means we can solve this for E in terms of S. L would be the inverse of this, the fourth order inverse tensor, we call that the compliance tensor, okay? And so this model would be appropriate even if the material suffers large displacements, provided that the strains are small, okay? So you could imagine a scenario in which the rotations of the body are large, but the strains are small, then this constitutive equation would be entirely appropriate. Uh, for us in this course, we will revisit this constitutive equation for something called the elastic strain, the elastic part of the strain. If you remember on day one, we were looking at a uniaxial uh, tension test in which the elastic strain we indicated is empirically always very small in magnitude. In the three-dimensional analog would be that an elastic strain would be small. In this discussion here, we're talking about the total strain, but later on, we will invoke a constitutive relation like this for the elastic strain alone on the premise that the elastic strain is small in practice for a metallic material, okay? So I want to end my uh, survey of elasticity theory here.
we'll make extensive use of this uh, notion of elasticity in the course. Next time I want to uh, talk about differential geometry, the differential geometry of deformation in our Euclidean space of our common experience, three-dimensional Euclidean space. <coughs> and the reason for, for that is that um, a familiarity with the differential geometry will afford us very interesting interpretations of uh, geometry of plastic deformations, and in particular, dislocation fields induced by plastic deformations. Remember, we spoke earlier about the concept of dislocation. We can associate with that concept a very interesting uh, uh, topic in differential geometry which will allow us to easily understand the notion of compatibility of strain and so on. And will also lead us to understand why it is that in a plastically deformed body in general, you cannot have a state of vanishing stress everywhere in the, in the body. Okay. So let me end early today because we're going to make a change of topic here and this is a good place to stop. Okay, so you're now in a position to do homework number one, and so you should you should start on that. Any questions? Okay, if there if there are no questions, I will see you on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.